So hello everybody, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Kelly Lucas. I am a lead digital architect at Pegasystems. And the topic of today's presentation is the promises and pitfalls of uh, Drupal's cache system. A little background about me. I've been working with Drupal since uh, version six. Uh, this is my uh, ninth DrupalCon, uh, which is kind of bonkers. Uh, but my first time ever speaking, um, so keep that in mind as we go forward. <laughs> so somewhat ironically, the um, only DrupalCon of recent years that I have missed was DrupalCon Los Angeles, which I attended remotely by um, watching sessions online. Um, the conference organizers probably don't want me to mention that you can actually do that. Uh, but it's a great way to uh, catch up on the conference later. Um, and I got excited about the Drupal 8 cache system after watching presentations from uh, Wim Lears and Fabian uh, at DrupalCon LA, uh, because at the time I was working on a client project that was an internet website uh, where the bulk of the traffic was authenticated. Um, and at the time in Drupal 7, uh, authenticated users uh, didn't, um, couldn't, uh, get any benefit from Drupal's cache system. Uh, for the last two years, um, for me it was two years, for some people it was only six months, um, we've been rebuilding our uh, sites at Pega um, in Drupal 8 uh, from Drupal 7. So um, among the great things that Drupal 8 added, uh, like um, Twig support, uh, the config management system, CK editor, uh, to me, the Drupal 8 cache system was one of the biggest value propositions and one of the biggest reasons to move to Drupal 8. There's no other CMS, open source or otherwise, that provides such granular content caching and related dependency management, um, and thus such support for automated CDN content delivery network invalidation. Um, so I'm going to go over the promises of the Drupal 8 cache system in upcoming slides, but just to uh, set a baseline, why is caching important? Uh, it's to um, prevent repeated work, essentially. Uh, PHP processing, uh, database calls, calls to external services are all expensive, and anytime you can save that work, you reduce page load times, which enhances the experience for users. Seems kind of obvious, but worth uh, reiterating. So as mentioned in uh, Drupal 7, and I apologize ahead of time, some of these key charts are a little hard to read, so I'll try to um, uh, explain them. But in, uh, in Drupal 7, we had the anonymous page cache, which meant that anonymous users who weren't logged in, uh, uh, their pages would get cached. The problem was that the invalidation wasn't particularly smart. So while when you would update a node, uh, for instance, the anonymous page cache for that node would get cleared, but if that node appeared on other pages, you know, via views or blocks, um, those other pages wouldn't get invalidated. So you potentially have stale content on some pages. So Drupal 8 added a much smarter anonymous page cache, one that um, when you did update, say, a node in, in one place, not only did its page rep representation get invalidated in the page cache, but any other related page that happened to include that node, incidentally, could also be invalidated in the page cache. And that invalidation uh, worked not for just for Drupal's internal anonymous page cache, but now works uh, also for content delivery networks or uh, reverse proxies like Varnish using modules like Purge. But probably the biggest additional feature of uh, the Drupal 8 cache system is that now for the first time, Authenticated users can get significant benefits um, out of the Drupal 8 cache system through the dynamic page cache. So the way that the dynamic page cache works is that Drupal um, will generate a page minus any uh, uncacheable bits, uh, personalized bits typically, um, cache that, um, that page without the personalization and then in a separate step, right before sending the page to the browser, Drupal will fill in uh, the personalized bits into that cached page. And then BigPipe takes that a step further. 
uh, where that uh, injection of that personalized content actually happens on the browser side. So Drupal can actually send that cached page down to the browser and then in subsequent what are basically flushes uh, tell the, uh, the browser to fill in the personalized bits of the page. Drupal 8 also added what's known as the render cache um, or a component cache. This is a cache for reusable parts of a page that could get reused across multiple pages. So um, for instance, an, um, uh, a view uh, that might get used on multiple pages or uh, rendered media uh, that gets, gets used on multiple pages goes into that render cache, which makes um, the generation of either that anonymous uh, cached page or that dynamic cached page uh, faster even, on, um, even when that page hasn't been uh, built yet. So the, th what made this possible was the Drupal, ca cache, the Drupal cache API, which added properties to all those rendered bits, um, whether it's the uh, anonymously cached page or the dynamically cached page or components in the render cache, they all get properties. Um, they get cache tags, which define their data dependencies. So a uh, piece of rendered content can get tagged with node 123, media 456, user 789. And then when any one of those entities is updated in the system, <laughs> Drupal knows to invalidate uh, those parts of the cache. Additionally, Drupal added cache context, which tells Drupal um, of those, for those rendered pieces of content, what kind of variants are possible. Very common one is user role. So you might have a differently cached version of a dynamic uh, page uh, by user role. Um, and same with the render cache. And lastly, cache max age is a uh, property of rendered content that essentially uh, defines the lifetime of that content in the cache. Um, for things that you can use cache tags for, typically that's marked as permanent um, because you rely on cache tag invalidation. But for things that you don't have a lot of insight into its data dependencies, for instance, coming from an external service, or if it's just time bound, like the weather, uh, max age is kind of a fallback. Um, so when it comes to the cacheability metadata of particularly things in the render cache or components, it's important to keep in mind that that cacheability metadata bubbles up uh, from the inner components on a page um, up through to the um, page uh, and response itself. And so this slide just demonstrates and uh, it sort of reiterates the fact that, let's say I update image media one, two, five, um, and, let, and it's the hero uh, image on a blog post, and it's the thumbnail on a blog listing page, and uh, also appears on the home page in a, in a view block. Uh, Drupal knows that when I update media 125 to invalidate all those pieces of the page cache. So just to uh, go back to that lazy build step that I mentioned uh, in respect to the dynamic page cache, I mentioned single I mentioned big pipe uh, originally with I think until Drupal 8. Six or maybe 8.5, uh, single flush was the default. Um, and we actually have this graphic, which it, it, look, it comes out better on that screen over there. Um, but you see in steps one and two, um, Big Pipe essentially sends down the skeleton of the page and then sends down multiple um, uh, flushes that uh, tell the browser to fill in the personalized parts of the page. Um, whereas single flush, um, all that replacement is happening on the server side and then the browser gets it in one fell swoop. The advantage of Big Pipe, maybe somewhat obvious, is that that time to first interaction for the user is um, significantly higher. So they can interact with the page sooner. So I, I think I went over the, the promises of the Drupal 8 cache system pretty quickly. Um, but um, I, I hope that's I hope that, that somewhat <coughs> evident. Um, before I get into you know, the gotchas, I want to emphasize that um, these aren't comprehensive. You may have uh, uh, encountered your own pitfalls, um, and some of these may not a problem, be a problem for you at all. Um, but just things to keep in mind um, 
as you consider working with uh, Drupal 8 or as you've already started working with Drupal 8. So at Pega, um, one thing that we um, are doing uh, is integrating with uh, a Drupal agnostic design system uh, called Bolt. Uh, luckily, it uses Twig, so we're able to integrate it at that level. But the way that uh, Bolt thinks about components, say uh, a card or a feature band or a collection, um, we have to sort of translate that um, it, using some advanced theming, um, a little bit of chicanery, <laughs> um, to map, you know, Drupalisms to, to those design components. Um, and we use the UI patterns module along with um, some uh, twig and a lot of pre-processing to make that happen. I kind of like to call that server-side progressive decoupling. That was a word that Dries was using for a while. He hasn't used it much lately. Um, but I think the key takeaway that I want to emphasize is that out of the box um, and by design, the Drupal 8 cache system works best. Um, when you're controlling the display and layout of content with a block system, display modes and views. Um, in other words, it's very site builder centric, which makes complete sense. Um, uh, but that's the expectation that the Drupal 8 cache system has for how you're going to use it. And so when you start uh, slightly deviating from that, uh, for good reasons or for expedient reasons, uh, that's when you can negate uh, the advantages of the Drupal 8 cache system. So one um, completely legitimate way, um, uh, one completely uh, advanced theming technique is of course customizing Twig. And in this case, this is a very, very simple example of um, a theoretical uh, entity uh, Twig uh, override where we're picking and choosing which fields we want to output and we're wrapping them in some fancy HTML. Um, on the left side, though, you see, you're, I mentioned that the cache tags in that case won't bubble. And that's because that content variable um, that is common to um, a lot of Twig templates is what actually contains or has sort of the pre-rendered cacheability metadata for that, uh, that uh, Twig template. And if you're picking and choosing which fields to render and you're not ultimately rendering that content uh, variable, um, though that cache cacheability metadata won't bubble up to the other pages, which means you could have some stale content um, display on your site. And then the trick is, um, this is you know, straight from Stack Overflow, um, is to uh, set a throwaway variable with the rendered version of that content field. Um, and that causes Drupal to see that you've rendered, uh, or that, to see that you've rendered the content and bubbles up the cacheability metadata. So one other big gotcha, and one thing that I wasn't really aware of until I got um, a bit along in our Drupal 8 development process was uh, the really tricky problem of caching lists of content, aka views. Um, out of the box and by default, um, Drupal ships with um, a couple of cache tags, the entity type cache tags, like node underscore list or term underscore list and if you build a view of nodes, by default, it gets that cache tag, node underscore list. And so then when you update um, any node in the system, Drupal will invalidate any view with the node list cache tag. So just think about that. If I update any node of any type, any list of nodes will get invalidated. So if I update, say, uh, a blog, on my site, the list of events could potentially get invalidated. Uh, if I update um, a press release, the list of case studies could get invalidated. And that um, is not good. It ultimately um, it's, it helps defeat the, or defeats the purpose of the Drupal 8 cache system. Luckily, uh, Contrib has um, some good modules to help you work around that. One is the handy cache tag modules. And that adds some narrower um, cache tags that you can use uh, in, and those narrower cache tags are, th are things like uh, lists by content type. So uh, article list or uh, blog post list or uh, press release list, essentially. And then the, along with the views custom cache tag modules, uh, module, 
that adds the ability to add those custom or those handy cache tags or own custom cache tags to a view. It also does the job of removing that entity type list, that broader uh, cache tag from your view. So now if I update blog three, only the blog listing page and maybe the home page will get invalidated. Um, you can also uh, take that a step further. Let's say for instance, you had a recipe website and um, you want to, and you had a list of vegetarian recipes or maybe a couple of views where you're listing vegetarian recipes. Uh, you could write a little custom code that um, on node, uh, in this case on node pre-save, will invalidate a custom cache tag based on that taxonomy term. Um, and then again, using views custom cache tags, you can configure your views um, uh, to use that cache, that cache tag. So another, in our case, one um, gotcha that we ran into uh, related to unnecessary cache invalidations was related to automated processes. On one of our websites, we were pulling in content from an external feed, and we were doing that pretty blindly. Uh, we just had a list of all the external content, and we, we pulled it in and updated a bunch of nodes, uh, irregardless of whether that content had actually changed in the source system, which meant that we were invalidating uh, the cache of a bunch of nodes unnecessarily, and relatedly, potentially invalidating a bunch of um, other pages. <laughs> So in our case, this was a custom solution. Um, we implemented some hashing of that source data on import so that we could actually detect when that source data changed and then only uh, update and save the content uh, in case that, that hash had changed. Uh, the migrate system, the migrate API, actually has that mechanism built in. Uh, so if you do recurring migrations, you can configure your migrate plugin with track changes and then when you run, when you run uh, Drush migrate import with that update flag, it'll only uh, pull in the changes that have changed in the source system. So going back a bit to that, um, to the idea of sort of advanced theming or going out of the guardrails, um, another thing that we encountered early on in the development was that we were seeing for authenticated users, um, pretty slow page load times and we were like, well, what, what, what's happening? The dynamic page cache is supposed to help us with that. Um, and in this case, we narrowed it down to this um, user menu that was included on every, on every page. Um, and it, it's personalized. It says, hello, Kelly, and it has a link to my profile. Um, and we'd actually, we'd, we'd done this the right way almost when we created the render array and we're injecting this into the page outside of the block system, I should uh, add, that, that's key, um, we did tag it with uh, the user context. And, but that was a trigger to Drupal to say, hey, um, that means I can't cache the output that's going into the dynamic, or that would go into the dynamic page cache. And I know it's a little hard to read, but um, on the right side there, that's, um, that's just the, uh, an HTTP header that you can enable um, on your site. And all it's saying is that to for the Drupal dynamic page cache, uh, this page was uncacheable. So what we had to do was, uh, in constructing that render array <coughs> for that uh, dynamic content, we had to um, move the actual uh, creation of that personalized content into uh, what's called a lazy builder callback. Um, and then we added a uh, element um, this is all documented in the render API, which I'll have links to, um, uh, with an element called lazy builder that points to that function. You could also potentially pass it arguments. Um, you also tell uh, the, the Drupal system to create a placeholder. Um, and again, we had cache context already on that render array, but that's, that's part of the uh, formula that's needed to tell Drupal to uh, replace that content in the lazy build step as opposed to the first rendering step. Another gotcha that we ran into uh, was related to large navigation menus. Does anybody here use the book module in core? Yeah, that's about three or four people out of <laughs> 200. <laughs> um, and 
one thing they may or may not be aware of is that the book module, the book navigation in core right now is not cacheable. Um, obviously, there isn't a huge lot of, a lot of demand uh, for that. Um, so, but it's good to know that Pega isn't the only company that's using book modules still nowadays. But in fact, we use it for uh, software documentation that we're importing from an external system. And some of these books uh, are thousands of pages lar long, um, and the book navigation then becomes huge. And so um, until we fixed to that, um, we were seeing 40 to 50 second initial load time, uh, page load time, and those pages weren't, weren't cacheable. <coughs> so um, with the help of Benji Fisher at Isovera, um, who actually has a really detailed blog post on this subject and a really great presentation from Nerd Summit. Um, he and, and his colleagues at Isovera helped us solve this. Um, first, they uh, tuned the menu generation itself uh, so that it would, uh, it would um, happen faster. Uh, then he made it possible that they, we could cache that navigation once per book as opposed to once per page. One thing to keep in mind about the caching of uh, menus in general is it's actually really tricky because they do have to vary by page because Drupal keeps track of the active trail um, in, on the menu. And uh, there are complex permissions in Drupal that control like what people can see and, and not see and that makes the, the caching of menus even trickier. And that work just wasn't ever ported over to the book module. In this case, we had a, a, a purpose-built solution um, because we could make compromises on some of those things. Like we didn't really care if somebody saw a link to a page that they didn't necessarily have access to. It wasn't really a use case that, that, had, that was uh, relevant to us. And to make the, the navigation uh, cacheable by uh, book, we moved the logic to set the active trail onto the client side. Um, so expanding the, act, the current page that the person's on happens sort of after the, the page loads. The result was that that made uh, big pipe, the, the, that navigation of BigPipe eligible. So uh, even on cold caches, at least the person got the, uh, the content of the page, even if the menu uh, appeared um, on the page later. And then with uh, cached pages, we were seeing about two to three second load times. Still not great. That navigation is still huge. Um, but we're looking at future optimizations. Uh, for instance, to offload more of that rendering to the client side. Um, and then potentially to do what I'm calling pump priming, which means just sort of generating that uh, navigation at the time the book gets created. So I've talked a bit, I've talked a bit about big pipe. One thing just to keep in mind, there, there are some prerequisites. Um, your, um, your hosting service, your web server needs to support um, uh, what PHP calls output buffering, essentially streaming, um, instead of saving up all the rendered content and then sending it out at once. Uh, similarly, if you use a content delivery network or a reverse proxy like Varnish, that has to be configured to support streaming and output buffering. And then also in our case, um, we had to work through uh, some bad uh, Drupal behaviors implementations in custom code. Um, in some cases, people were using, developers had used it kind of as a proxy for document on ready, which it's really not. It sort of is, but it's not. Um, because when BigPipe injects that personalized content into the page, uh, it's calling Drupal attached behaviors. And so if you have some custom behavior uh, behaviors, you have to make sure that they are compatible. They don't, things, don't do things like add multiple click events uh, to content on the page. So this next slide really just, uh, I wanted to put in here to emphasize, uh, it's more of a, a, a call to action for myself and for the community. There isn't a lot of tooling uh, in core or contrib to uh, measure hit rates or miss rates on any of the, the uh, Drupal uh, cache, um, which makes sort of analyzing where you could uh, address problems difficult. Um, in this case, uh, th this is just a screenshot um, of our Fastly dashboard. Fastly is our content delivery network. And it'd be really cool if we could get to the point where we're actually able to see sort of miss rate over time or hit rate over time um, for the Drupal 8 cache system. There was, um, in D7, a module called Heisen Cache, which probably is a good candidate for something to get ported to Drupal 8. So just a couple of uh, development and debugging tips uh, to use and keep in mind. 
um, when working with the Drupal 8 cache system. Um, develop with caching enabled as much as possible um, and test as different users and roles. That will allow you to hopefully catch problems in the development cycle sooner um, before you know, your customers or your users <laughs> encounter them. Um, and in your development.services YAML, in your local environment, you can enable cache tag headers. Um, and I know this is a little difficult to read, but that causes Drupal to output some HTTP headers in the response uh, that will tell you whether there was a cache hit, um, what the cache contexts were that bubble up to the response. So you can see whether there's variations or there's a cache context in there that's preventing uh, the response from being cached. It also adds a uh, cache tags uh, header, uh, which will show you all the data dependencies, all the, all the cache tags that bubbled up to the response. Um, the one thing to be careful of that, particularly um, in a local development environment, is that that header can get quite large. Um, and if your uh, web server isn't config, if your web server is config configured to limit the size of HTTP headers, you might run into a very difficult to diagnose white screen of death. Um, but just something to uh, keep in mind. Um, and also, uh, Wim Lears has developed uh, this render viz module, which kind of takes all that metadata that you can get out of the HTTP headers and actually puts it on the page and then allows you to visualize it and use um, console commands to interrogate, okay, which components on this page are using node list, for instance, um, or which uh, components on this page are using uh, a user role cache context. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, it's still in alpha. Uh, it's a, another great candidate for contributions. So just to wrap up, uh, the Drupal 8 cache system is a powerful feature um, and a key value pop proposition for Drupal 8. I think it's one of the, one of the biggest benefits uh, in, in Drupal 8, is, is certainly when it initially shipped. Um, and if you sidestep guardrails, that can lead to unanticipated and suboptimal results though I would fully admit that what those guardrails are is a little hazy. They're more like painted lines on the road, actually, um, that it's fairly easy to veer over. Um, custom theming uh, requires awareness and controls. Um, awareness on the part of your theme developers and potentially controls. Um, so for instance, using those HTTP headers, you might be able to run um, monitoring to see if um, the cacheabilities of key pages is changing between releases. Um, and site builders and developers need to proactively manage cache tags on views. I think that's one big one um, that people should be aware of, that to really, opti to really get a lot of the benefits out of the Drupal 8 cache system, you have to be careful about um, those list uh, cache tags. And then ultimately, and this especially goes out to uh, you know, your, your clients or your business people, that tuning uh, takes work and maintenance. That's not just for the Drupal 8 cache system, that's performance in general, and projects need to budget for it. So I just wanted to mention quickly uh, about what, sort of what's next for the Drupal 8 uh, cache system. Um, JSON API is going into core with 8.7. The REST module is already in core. I've heard talk of GraphQL potentially going into core. Um, all those things, uh, well, in particular JSON API and REST, already leverage the Drupal 8 cache API in terms of being able to cache responses and to invalidate responses in a smart fashion. So I could see how, uh, as people adopt decoupled, uh, more and more, that they can still leverage the Drupal 8 cache API. It's not, um, it's not just uh, a benefit to the standard theme system or the standard Drupal render pipeline. Um, for instance, I know Gatsby is working on the possibility of uh, partial or incremental site builds, and one could imagine um, the expiration of something by cache tag triggering a, a partial site build in a static site generator, for instance. Um, so here's a, I have a bunch of list of resources. Of course, I'll be posting the slides. Um, I wanna uh, thank everyone for coming. Uh, I especially wanna thank Wim Lears, who took time out of the 8.7 release to go over my slides with me, and, um, validate and vet them for me. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the people at uh, my NetCamp presentation who provided invaluable feedback, and the folks at PEGA who have seen this presentation several times already. Um, <laughs> It looks like we're right up on the wall in terms of time, but I think if anyone has like one question, uh, I think we can take it. Um, just uh, remember Friday is uh, contribution day. I hope people can uh, uh, stick around for that.
And if you uh, please um, go back, go to the site and um, add any feedback. Thanks.